two or three years ago, I believe it was, I was invited down to Dallas uh, to perform a wedding ceremony. As you may have remembered, several years ago, I was performing weddings all over the place for people from all, all states. And at this wedding um, ceremony that I performed in Dallas, uh, the bride requested, uh, along with the bride's groom, they, I had been on both of their broadcast. And the bride was a South African, uh, Africana, if you will, Japheth person, uh, who um, had been carrying out broadcasts for years. Um, and every broadcast she put up of ours that was taken off of our YouTube channel and put on our, um, on her channel, garnered more than five million votes every time. That's just how popular she was and our relationship was her popular. And it was a really exciting wedding as well, performing wedding for Jesus people from all over every place in a beautiful hotel in Dallas. And we had an interview with a, uh, uh, another broadcaster from Cape Town, South Africa, three weeks ago, I think it was. And uh, he asked me a question at the end of the broadcast, uh, which had been quite piercing. Um, you may have witnessed it this week if you watched the the trust, report, trust in the Lord and the Manning Report, he asked me, Pastor Manning, he says, after looking at the turmoil that's happening in South Africa, the race, racial problems between the, the black people and white people in, in, in South Africa, it's ongoing problem, and it's been going on for more than 150 years, the same length of time that the problems have been going on here in America between black people and white people, and it seems to be no end. There are no winners. That's not what he said, but that's what I understood him to express. And he said, as a non-Christian, if you will, if you look into your crystal ball, could you tell me what you see coming? And I said to him in a, 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 a if you will, impromptu ad hoc response was that I see darkness. And the darkness remains at present dark but darkness is not eternal. And at some point, darkness itself, with respect to the race relationship, the problems globally with, with black people and white people, wherever they may be found, that is the present darkness, whether South Africa or in America. And it's a thick darkness. But that darkness I see is not eternal in terms of what, what's in my heart, and that's what he wanted to know. What do you see in your heart for our future? And I said to him, at some point, the darkness will fade and the light will come shining through. And he said to me, Pastor Manning, in that South African, Africana voice, he said, you made the hair stand up on my arms when you said that. And I'm sure that it is true. Uh, for many would probably consider him a hater of black people. Uh, but the fact he's looking for peace, peace and truth, and that I gave him some hope that one day we will not be at odds with one another the way we are at present, touched him deeply. In front of you, there is a crystal ball. What do you see? Very dark, but once the dark itself has done as done in the days of the Bible, in the beginning of creation, has Darkness itself cannot maintain. It, 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 it is not a consistent, it's not eternal. It just isn't. It just isn't. And in that ball, I see the darkness. But once that darkness fades and it no longer has its power, light will flood and flourish humanity. And Jeremy, I'm glad you asked the question. Because I think a large part of humanity of uh, the unity of humanity on planet Earth has to do with the dark black man finally realizing where he needs to kneel and pray, what he needs to do in order to be able to integrate himself into society. And as a result of that, uh, it'll bring global, global peace in many ways. Listen, here in America, politics in America is always by black and white. The Republican Party, Democrat Party, Democrats got the black people on their side, and Republicans don't, and all the issues are around race. But once that darkness, that blackness, that 
is removed as an, as an existential, if you will, part of our existence, light will come. But it isn't going to be easy, and I'm not sure how long. The hair on my arms, Pastor Manning, is standing up. <laughs> Just from listening to that. It's a great way to end our conversation. I know that you have to, I know that you have to leave. Um, may I say that you are a true gentleman, uh, and it's an absolute pleasure uh, chatting to you. I'd want to read from Isaiah um, chapter 56, recently read, to, um, to launch us today in our subject matter that darkness is not eternal. Um, um, <clears throat> um, but thus saith the Lord, keep your judgment and do justice. For my salvation is near to come, Atla, and um, my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man that doeth this, and the son of man that layeth hold upon it, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, keepeth his hand from doing any evil. Neither let the son of the stranger that have joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch say, behold, I am a dry tree. For thus saith, the Lord unto the eunuchs that keep my Sabbaths and choose the things that please me and take hold of my covenant. Even unto them will I give mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than, the, than of the sons and of the daughters I will give them an everlasting name and they shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the strangers that join themselves to the Lord, to serve him, to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold, uh, and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, make them joyful in my house of prayer, their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord which gathereth the outcast of Israel saith, yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered to him. And all ye the beasts of the field come to the vow, yea, all ye the beasts in the fields, his watchmen, and blind, they are all ignorant, they are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, they are greedy dogs, we shall never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his gain from his quarter. Come ye and say they, I will fetch wine and I will fill ourselves with strong drink and tomorrow it shall be as this day and much more abundant. Now in those 12 verses, it again, Isaiah describes our condition um, with respect to the Lord gathering us and his rebuke of those who pollute the Sabbath, his love for us and his promise for us his blessings upon us as we serve him. And all of those that are opposed to us, they're called dogs. The shepherds, the pastors, the churches, the leaders that are against us, they're greedy dogs. And uh, they're ineffective. But our day shall soon come. And I will read the, uh, the, the balance of the verses out of um, that reference my statement to Jeremy Nell in uh, Isaiah 42 shortly. But the question that the interviewer asked me from South Africa regarding the circumstances that we find ourselves here in America, that is it ever gonna end? 
You had a black president. Did that end it? You've got black mayors. You've got black lives matter. And yet the beat goes on. Is it ever, is it ever, is it ever going to end? It's what was in Jeremy Nell's heart and the hearts of perhaps other people who may be noble of sorts. And uh, we're going to address that. But imagine if it had not been Jeremy Nell that asked that question from South Africa, Cape Town, if it had been Anderson Cooper of CNN, or Wolf Blitzer, or Jake Tapper, or perhaps Sean Hannity of Fox News, or someone from the Washington Post or the New York Times had asked such a question, had come and asked such a question of one who they think that perhaps or as does Jeremy Nell, that there lies an answer. What will our future be in terms of our race relations? Philosophically, if you don't mind my waxing there for just a moment, uh, I would ask that we of Atla, we the precious few of Atla, would pray for more darkness. And let me tell you why. Darkness is not eternal. And all it takes is one light and the darkness will go scurrying. It takes a light like, like this light that's here to defeat the darkness. But I would advise you philosophically and in a religious-based ideology of philosophy, I would advise you pray for more darkness. For the darkness that is upon us, such as uh, some of the things that we as a congregation endure uh, as a people, and as the righteous of God, as the word of God, as it is obscure and is disdained and damned in many ways, pray there's more of that. You know why philosophically? Because the more darkness, the brighter the light when the light finally shines. And the light is coming. So don't be afraid of the darkness. Don't be discouraged by the darkness. And I would further philosophically suggest that we will pray for more attacks. You remember when the crowd gathered a few years ago uh, with their love not hate signs outside, they purposed to come to interrupt our prayer meeting. They came on a Wednesday night, and at the time that we were to lift up our voices before the Lord God Almighty as a house of prayer for all people, they stood outside to interrupt that. I don't know if you remember being here that night. But pray there be more attacks on us. We're out to take the time to outline every attack that has been leveled against this house. Uh, I would be here all day. You don't have the time. And I've exercised the wisdom that don't let the enemy get your goat. Now that's what they say in North Carolina. See, if I stood up and said everything he did, then he would say, uh-huh, got him talking about me. And uh, I, it, must be, it must be painful, it must be effective because he's talking about me. But I just ignore it because I know where victory lies. But I pray that you pray for more attacks because the more attacks, the greater the victory. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. And so I, I want to be able to encourage you with those words today. Our witness, this witness of this church, is light and, and what it stands for. Um, it's been seen by people who you would never think was taking a look at it. Um, and we need to get prepared for when the light comes. For the light is coming. There's no doubt about it. Whether it comes in our favor or not, light is coming. Jesus gave the great expression philosophically that he is the light of the world. And light is coming. Darkness will not prevail. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. Yes. It's what God did. So light is coming, and we need to get prepared. Whether the light will shine on our favor, when the light comes, and it is coming, whether it will demonstrate that we are true and we are righteous, that's, that's, you can deal with that any way you choose. But it's coming. And when it comes, it will reveal truth. When the light comes, it will reveal righteousness when it does come. And so we need to be prepared. And I would suggest that we get prepared to hold judgment. As America 
loses its world influence. I'll be more detailed about that as, as we go along. But we need to be prepared to exercise and demonstrate judgment. You know, if you look at our biblical position that we are neither on the right or the left in regards to American ideology politically, but we're on the Lord's side. And we are able to give the status of a judge because we don't favor one or the other. And we remain that way. And we'll continue to remain that way. But the day will come when the, the question will be asked, is there any word from the Lord? And we'll be able to give that, that kind of a judgment. So pray for more darkness and pray that more attacks happen to us as a congregation, as the races, that is to say Japheth and Hamite or black and white people in America are taking up arms now against each other. More recently, the attack on the Temple of Democracy on the 6th of January down in, at, uh, at the uh, transferring of power of the presidency as uh, the Dems are fighting the Republicans. And basically what it is, it's blacks against whites, or, if you will. Um, but the day will come when at some point, what Jeremiah said, Jeremy rather said in that interview, is there any word from the Lord? We know what all the leaders are saying. We know what Mandela has said. We know what Obama has said. We know what Trump has said. We know what Bush has said. We know what Clinton has said. But is there any word from the Lord? Is the question he asked because none of those things have solved the problem. We know what Dr. King has said, but they're still marching. They're still dying. We know what they all have said, but is there any word from the Lord? And the answer is yes. Oh, Lord! That's what God said. That's what God said. I, I, wanna, I wanna turn a corner for just a second. <laughs> I think I picked up on a, another favorite phrase from Boom Shackalaka to turn in the corner. And I'm coming back to that. The, um, the, the other day, precious Miriam Babaloa Lafloa, she got enough names to name five, ten, ten different people, came to our door for some matter, I'm not sure what. And uh, she explained to me that she had received her master's degree from... Um, in English and critical writing from uh, Southern New Hampshire University. And uh, gave a congratulations. I think I even posted a note about that uh, in, um, on our Atla Alert, if you will, Facebook, Twitter account. And the other day, Precious was with um, the school, the camp, that was up here on the 124th Street I believe is where they were. Uh, they've got a play street up there now. She was up there with the children. They were dancing. The children were dancing. They were kind of dancing, a, a group dance kind of thing. And Precious was on the side. Now, unfortunately, she can't dance, but, <laughs> but she, she was doing her very best. I could see all the energy she was putting in it, but the young people were just gone beyond where she was at. But I, I thought for a second about this quite, I want you to hear this. Because I, I think it's meaningful. I, I, it's, it's so important. It's so important for leadership. Uh, brother elders and leaders, it's so important to hear this, what God showed me about Precious. She's got a master's degree, right? <laughs> Some of y'all, before you graduated high school, remember how lofty it was to think of ever having a master's degree? If you can just get a bachelor's, that'd be, that would be the cat's meow. But a master's degree, she's got. And, uh, but she pretty much volunteers work for the church. She don't get paid much money, I can tell you that, if she gets paid anything at all. But you know what the Lord showed me as he brought her face up close about Precious? Is that she didn't get that master's degree because she wants to get a bigger paycheck. No, she got that master's degree because she wants to be a better person. And she wants to be a better servant here in the house of the Lord. That's a difference, that's, that's a difference. She's not looking for money, that's, 
She's not looking for an uptick. She's not looking to change. She wants to be a better person. She wants to be everything that God can cause her to be. And I have to tell you, you need to look at that. She's not the only one. People aren't going to school because they want to get a bigger paycheck. But they love this ministry and they want to improve themselves. They want to be better people. Pay, pay very careful attention now as we examine the character of persons such as Precious and others that are in the master's degree program. And uh, Dretrus Myers who acquired about the PhD program just this past week. And others. The blessings in this house is that people aren't looking for money. They're just looking to be better people, better servants. You can't pay for that. You can't, you can't buy that. That's happening in this house. Yesterday I got a, a note from, um, from uh, Alton Garcia Rope. Uh, she said, Father Manning, <laughs> Father Manning, I'm on my way to Dubai. And I'm on my way to uh, discover whether or not I want to complete a, an association with a, a major international hotel chain that I inquired with some time ago and all of a sudden now the application information has come up and they've sent me transportation and, and information for me to come to Dubai uh, to study there for a week. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise Almighty God. I think that's great that that's happening. She's in Dubai now. I got to get there one day myself. It's uh, the architect of that city just drives me crazy. Anna, you got, you got to go to Dubai. You, you got to the architects that developed those islands there in the middle of the uh, Persian Gulf is absolutely exquisite in the United Arab Emirates. She's there this morning as one of our members. Um, and I told her about the Great Woman Hotel. Don't worry about the hotel that's interested in you now. We got one coming. We need to get prepared for the opportunity. So she made an application years ago, or some time ago, and it has just been completed for her to make that trip. I also want to point out as we get prepared and that we understand that the, uh, the street ministry of Elder LaFleur, I have the opportunity uh, to take the lazy position here in the church. Yeah, I do. I can look on my, uh, my system, my computer device, and we got security cameras everywhere. <laughs> they're, 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 they're everywhere, all over the building, all outside, all up, down the streets. And I can watch as I do other things the, uh, what's happening with the ministry, with the children on the street, their comings and their goings, and watch the interaction of Elder LaFleur with the children, with his responsibilities, and, um, and other teachers as well. I I'm able to, and it's, it's a witness to the community, because they see it too. They don't see it on their cameras, but they see it every day. They see, they see the fire in this house. They, they see they hear the laughter of the children all the way up to 124th Street. The children are laughing. And they hear that. And they see it. And it's a great witness. And now more and more people are coming up to him and saying how much they appreciate the ministry. And they are now approving all the, of the things that we put on the sign. And now he's involved in neighborhood activities. I mean, he's, our van was used the other day to help a store down the street transport some stuff that their van weren't big enough for. They came, they figured they could ask him that, and he acquiesced. The street ministry, the witness that's going forth from this house is very powerful. Don't you ever forget what God is doing. The parents trust him. The parents believe in him. Um, I, Sheba's mother called the other day and said she's on her way to Ethiopia. And she said she called Elder LaFleur to make sure everything is watched over while she, and she's gone for a month. But her daughter, Sheba, is she in the house today? Yeah, yeah she's here. Uh, that the elder would watch over her while she's away in Ethiopia for a month. And uh, Sister Roke called him yesterday and said, make sure my children get picked up and get taken care of. As you know, she's pretty much a single parent in many regards. The parents trust him. I'm telling you, the witness of this house is growing greater and greater every day. And it cannot be denied. 
The light. Yes. The light. The light is coming. This past Sunday, we had Bathsheba Sherman out there in the courtyard uh, with the Hagar Artists and Writers event. Is Naomi in the house today? Where's Naomi? Naomi in the house? She's not. Oh, Naomi. So when Naomi was out there, she had a little artist patch, right? So I said, Naomi, what you gonna do? She said, oh, I'm gonna draw a crocodile and a mermaid. And she's very confident, like, you're gonna like it when you see it. I doubt it. <laughs> but a Japheth family of husband and wife and children came into the courtyard, sat down, and, and interacted with, the, with our leaders out there. It's, I'm telling you, the light is shining in this community. I want you to hear that. You may not know about it, but you need to be encouraged that the light is shining. And one day, this darkness that they have put us in will no longer be. And people will know that Allah, that's what God said. And he said it, and he meant it. I, I believe that in the writings of, of um, Isaiah, I have been I have been encouraged. I have been brought comfort. I remember years ago at the Rayford Correctional Facility, Union Correctional Facility, one of the persons locking next door to me got some really bad news. And uh, it was a letter that he had read. And upon getting that bad news, he took his coffee cup, which is a mug he had, and smashed it against the wall and it broke it, broke into little pieces. And I notice about people who get frustrated. Many times they kick over things. They, they just smash things. They, they rip up the house because that's a way of venting their frustration. I've been frustrated. While there at the same prison, I got a call from the chaplain's office uh, one morning. And uh, I was taken off the work detail and told I had to go to the chaplain's office. I knew it was not good news. I knew it was not good news. When I got there, the chaplain sat me down. And he said to me, he said, we got a report. Your mother has sent us a verification report and we verified it. Actually, they had had it for a whole day, but they wouldn't give it to me because they didn't believe her. They had to verify it. They had to call the local police authorities in my little town to make sure that it was absolutely true. We said, we verified that your sister has been killed and um, they wanted you to know it. And I, I said, okay, is there anything else? He told me who it was and to some degree, how it had taken place. And I sat and I listened. And after that, I got up. Now, was I frustrated, I suppose, but not at the point where I was gonna break a cup or punch somebody or begin to curse and scream. That, that was not, that's not my agenda even up today. I mean, I've, I've had some bad news. I've had to stand here in this lectern, behind this lectern and say some things to y'all I would to God. I didn't have to tell y'all that was the case, but I had to, as a man, I had to come up here and I had to speak to y'all as a congregation, as a leader, to let you know, though that not moment and may have been dark, Light is coming. And I stood here. And I'll stand here again if more bad news comes. But I wanted to be able to say to you, and looking at that over the years of the leadership of this church, that the reading and writing of Isaiah of late has been a great comfort to me. It has really, I can't express to you how I feel, the joy that each chapter brings to me, each verse. The encouragement that I've been found in the book of Isaiah, I've discovered that I, uh, I have not taught Isaiah in the last 20 years, 25 years. I think it was in 2014 in Capernaum that God spoke the Lord's servant to me when we were traveling in Israel. If y'all remember that, we were staying up in the North Country. We went up there for the first day. And, uh, and I had never paid as much attention to the reference, the Lord's servant, uh, as, I, as it's everywhere in the book of Isaiah, everywhere you look. And not just that, but righteousness is everywhere you look. 
in, in the readings and the writings of Isaiah. And so that refrain just continues. I have to tell you, it has brought joy, it has brought comfort, it has brought assurance and encouragement to me to see what Isaiah is saying. I say the same thing all the time, all the time. I mean, it's like I am Isaiah. For the things that he says, I say repeatedly. And the naming of the Lord's servant, it is just an absolutely very powerful time. I think during the Palm, the Good Friday event, I expressed to you that there was a frenzy going on in America and people were deserting Jesus like a ship, like rats deserting the Titanic or sinking ship. And um, I, uh, the Lord asked me to speak and I spoke. And I spoke out against Obama, the long-legged Mac Daddy. And I explained clearly what God said. Nothing less, nothing more of what God said. But you know, the Lord asked Isaiah if he would go and speak for him. That he dwelt among a people with dirty lips. And that Isaiah even was unclean. When the Lord asked me to stand up and speak, I did not reject, but I went. And it's been 14 years now that I've stood in the midst of a people with unclean lips and darkened hearts, and I've spoken on behalf of God. So when I see what Isaiah has said and how the Lord has, has prospered his word even to this very day, I'm blessed. I want you to know I'm a happy man. I'm very encouraged today. I, 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 I don't know a time of depression. I don't know if that has ever been my lot, but I'm a happy man today. God knows I am. It, it is like he's preaching to me every day. He comes, every chapter speaks power to my soul. I, I'm a happy man. I am this morning, I have to tell you. And I'm so thankful to get up here today and to be able to speak. I, uh, last night early in the night, I was wondering if I would get here tonight, today rather. I wanted to get here so bad to be able to tell you that I'm a happy man. I got so much joy what Isaiah is bringing in his word. And I know it's true. You may not believe me when I say righteousness. You may not believe me. You may not believe me when I say I'm the Lord's servant. You may not believe me. But Isaiah says it all the time. You believe him, don't you? You believe him? <laughs> Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. So I'm so thankful to the Lord I, I can stand here today. I'm glad I didn't miss this. No mishap caused me to not be able to come and speak these words today. And so our growth also is um, been promised by, by Almighty God that he will cause, we may look as if we are a minuscule group let, let me read from Isaiah. I, I'm going to read a, a few chapters here today and I'm going to turn y'all loose. Um, <clears throat> the, um, I don't know which I want to read first. I read Isaiah 42. Um, two weeks ago, but I'll read it again. Verse one, behold my servant whom I uphold mine elect and whom my soul delight. Now this is what God is saying about his servant. He said my soul delighteth in him. I put my spirit upon him and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles, I want you to, let's go to Isaiah chapter 53, quickly, or as we can get there. <clears throat> uh, 
Elder Hartfield will love this, this chapter. I'm sure he does. It's a favorite of his. Who have believed our report? Who have believed Atla? Who have believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For she he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He have no form, no comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire. And people may say that about us. He is despised and rejected of men. And uh, a man of sorrows, a man acquainted with grief, and, um, and we esteemed him not. Surely have borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. <clears throat> but he was wounded for our transgressions, and he was bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. The late Elder Davis, who was a uh, deacon in this church when I first walked down the aisle of Bethelite years ago, later we ordained him as an elder. He passed away several years ago. And, um, but he used to have a statement regarding Isaiah when he would speak. And, he would call Isaiah the eagle eye prophet. And he referred to him as such, and some of you may be aware of that phrase as well, because in Isaiah chapter 53, he is prophesying the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's what he's prophesying. And eagles, as you know, though they can fly high above the terrain of earth, have little eyes, but yet they can see the smallest ant. From a mile to two miles high, they can see an ant or small fish, or they can see the tail of a fish in a stream. And they'll swoop down into that stream and pick that fish up and go back up two miles high. They are called eagle, people with great vision are called eagle eyes. And that's what this prophet is saying about, about Isaiah. And, and again, it's, it's, just, it's just a blessing um, to me to have, to have this period of time. And, I, and I, I want you to know that, that the pastor is joyful this morning. I, wa I want you to know that if you're concerned about me and perhaps some of the things that we are tasked with doing, the pastor is happy today. I'm not fearing anybody. I'm thankful. I want you to know that. I, I want you to know that... Uh, Isaiah is my life. I'm Isaiah, if you will, every chapter. I don't know what the remaining chapters will reveal, but I, it's, it's just been an extraordinary time. And in a moment, I want to try to put that in some sort of context that why is it that, and I don't know if you agree with me about the likeness of Isaiah's prophecy and the prophecy that I have expressed and the things that you've heard me say my call for righteousness, his call for righteousness. My name is the Lord's servant, his calling of the Lord's servant. The similarities and how consistent and how often he makes those, those things known, known. Whether you agree with me or not, that, that it is a verification, if you will, of my existence and my presence and authentication, if you must, of the validity of who I am and that we're on the right path and we're going down the right road and we're going at the right time, that, that this is such a blessing and I pray that it means the same thing to you, that, that you understand it. But we're, we're in a time where we have been speaking of the hidden manna that's found in the book of Revelation, the church of Pergamos, chapter 2, verse 17, that we shall be given to eat of the hidden manna. And for all the years that this lectern has been here, little do we know that it was the white stone. And why would we do it anyway? Baptists and, 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 and if you will, Hamite people, they like the carpet on their churches. They like red carpet, purple carpet, blue carpet. They don't deal with stones. They don't put white stones on the floor. They don't put white stones with lectern here. But, but is this 
are we now being confirmed in God of his word and of his prophecy? Several years ago, when we didn't have a home, we, we didn't have a church home. Um, and I was just a young pastor. That's why I want to hold on to Minister Williams and Elder Hartfield as long as I possibly can in potential. And Elder Butler as well and Mother One. Because they remember when I was a young boy pastor and we didn't have a church building. We worshiped in my home. <laughs> we had prayer meeting on my sofa in my living room. And when we got together in the assembly, we were able to get a gymnasium to worship it. We didn't have a building like this. And I was just a young pastor, two, three days old as a pastor. And uh, so I said, Dr. Gunn said, well, I'd ask all the Baptist preachers, can we use your choir room? Because they get these big old churches. Can we use your choir room? We had a little congregation. Can we use your choir room to worship? Well, brother pastor, sometimes the choir likes to get robed up on Sunday. So I don't know we're going to be able to help you, but we're going to pray for you. But we can't. And every church told me the same thing. Baptist, Methodist, Pentecostal, all the churches of Harlem. I went to seven Adventist churches. They all told me the same thing. Brother Pastor, we can't help you, but we're going to pray for you, Brother Pastor. So I went to this one pastor, Linton Gunn, at the St. James United Presbyterian Church on 141st and uh, uh, St. Nick. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and he said, well, Pastor, he said, I heard you're a union student, right? I said, what's going on over there in the union? I said, yeah, I am. He said, I'll let you use our gymnasium, but you can't come in our sanctuary. He said, don't let your people in our sanctuary. Now, you can use our gymnasium. We'll open it up and get the basketball court out there, but not your people. Don't, don't let your people come in our sanctuary. And uh, Mother One, you'll remember, we never went in that sanctuary. Once we asked him to let us use the kitchen, and a big fight broke out between one of our members and one of the members of the St. James Church. So we were restricted for two years to the gymnasium or to my house. Now I want to tell you this because I want you to know no matter how dark it gets, light does come. And so worshiping there, and I was thankful to God to worship. We didn't have a key. We had to wait till a man named Keys came and opened the door for us to get in the building on Sundays. And uh, so I said, you know, I know what it is to be homeless. I've been homeless. When I came home, I didn't have a place to stay. And when we took this church, I got put out in the street. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like. And so I said, if a church ever comes to me and knocks on our door and says, can you let us worship? I'm gonna say, yeah. I'm not gonna ask them what they preach or teach. I'm gonna say, yeah, go somebody let me in. And I let this church in, I let a couple of churches in. This most recent church I let come in. And I, I let them worship here. And I, it would come in at 7.30 and 9.30 and then I noticed that there'd be all kind of people coming and going. So one day I, I, I'm looking on, on, on the screen. So when I decided to come down and there's another group of people sitting over here. He's sitting over there. Then I saw him walking around the building. And so I said, wait, this guy's running a Mickey Ficky on us. He, he's, he's allowing our church to be subletted to two other pastors. And then when a conference was to, be, was to happen, he would rent our church out to somebody who wanted to have a conference. It wasn't even his conference. He would collect money because we were gracious enough to let him use our church. And so then he actually called and said, well, there's another church that wants to have a wedding. Will you let them use your church? I said, yeah, we'll let them use it, uh, our church. And so we did. And while I'm, they're setting up for the wedding, they're going to broadcast the wedding all the way back to Africa. I'm going to be through with this in just a moment. They're setting up all kinds of screens. They got more cable on the floor than you would have at CBS television. They got all kinds of cameras. They got drums and all kinds of musical instruments. Uh, the place is lousy with instruments. They're going to broadcast this wedding all the way back to Africa. They got this great big screen. And in order to be able to affect their screen, Two men, probably in their early 30s, stinking out of heaven, one grabbed the end of this lectern and the other grabbed the other end and picked it up and walked it over here. Now I was upstairs barefoot and yeah about naked. I went out the door, down the steps, came into this building. They moved this white stone. I threw them all out. The bride was sitting here waiting to get married. I threw them out. 
And if anyone had given me any lip, I would have given them, you know what? Now, I was ready to beat the hell out of every last one of them. They touched this pulpit. They touched it. These brutes, these ignorant, stinking, low-life people had no regard for the, come into another man's house and move his lectern like that. I threw him out. That's important. I don't think I've told y'all about that. Some of you may have known about it. But this white stone, don't touch this. Don't, 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 don't. Who would do such an evil thing? But we've got the white stone. And we've got the new name. And I've been teaching recently in our prayer meeting sessions about demons. And it's been an interesting teaching. The other day, Wednesday, I have been getting somewhat of a break, but you know, a pastor never gets a break. He never gets a vacation. I think Precious LaFleur said to me, she said, Pastor, she said, Captain LaFleur works all the time. He works late at night, late at night he's up working, and even when we're on vacation, he's working. I thought to myself, good. <laughs> she said, Pastor, you gotta talk to him. He don't never rest. He's all, I said, she's a wife, so what you gonna do, you know? <laughs> don't know to go. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, doggone, he need to work. He ain't working enough. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, but the pastor really never gets an opportunity to, to, to rest because he's orchestrating the work. And uh, so Wednesday came around and I needed to be able to prepare for, to teach on Wednesday night, more lessons on the demons because it had not concluded. And um, I, I said to the Lord, I said, you know, I, 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 have been, I have been saying things that are hidden manner in terms of scripture and understanding about demonology and tactics. And, uh, I, you know, I, I don't know if I could do that again tonight. And the Lord said, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell you, it's been a long time, but I got a good rebuking from the Lord. He said, oh, you think it's you that's doing the teaching. I was silent. It's best not to say anything. <laughs> you think it's you. Oh, I see. <laughs> oh. And I, I, I guess I did think that it was me. Now, I don't mean to say that I that I don't acknowledge the Lord. You know that I do. You know that I do. But you have to be very careful. You start putting limits on God or taking stuff to yourself that God is doing. I, I, I shut up and I came down here and I talked with and I, <laughs> but I confessed at the end of the message that I'd never talked like this before. I, I'm, I, I, what I really wanted to say, I just got rebuked myself because I've never talked like this before. I've never taught messages about demons. I, I, I've, I've been doing this for 40 years, people, and I've never eaten manna the way I'm eating now. I've never done, I've been in this church and I've taught a lot of messages. God knows I have over the years. I never teach the same message twice. Of the message of trusting the Lord with all thine heart, lean not to thine own understanding. Nearly 4,000 messages on those two verses alone. I've never taught like this before. I've never. I've never. I, and I confessed it that, um, that that's what's going on. But I was, I was ready to take the rebuke. There's one other thing that I asked the Lord about the other day in the prayer closet, and that is, is that he told me three years ago that my life was just beginning. And um, now there's some personal things that I will not share with you. I don't think you want to know about them anyway, uh, about my life. But all the years I've lived and all the things I've done and perhaps some of what I thought were accomplishments. He said, I, I'm just beginning to live. I said that three years ago. I know Genesis, uh, Lewis heard it. Maybe she shared it with some of her friends. The pastor Manning's life is just beginning. And that was three years ago that, 
And I, I am really in a, in a true sense of the word in terms of what life is. And I've lived long enough to know what it ain't. And now I'm living as it is. But it isn't just me. It's all of us that I'm your shepherd. And I will lead the way if you will follow. And we all shall live and not die. We all shall live and live abundantly if you will follow me. It isn't just for me that God is speaking. But, you know, I, I've known my youth. Uh, ask anybody of any age, they'll tell you, the years go by just like that. You don't even know they're gone. You turn around, you're 50, turn around again, you're 70. And, it's all, and you wonder where the time went. Ask anybody, they'll tell you. But I remember what I was like when I was 17. I remember what I was like when I was 20. I remember my body. I remember my abilities. And I can tell you, except for some stiffness now, because I don't exercise, except for some stiffness now, there ain't no difference in my body. I, I, uh, the doctor told me I should lose some weight. And I, you know, he was doing a cardiogram on me, right? You know how they put them stickers all over everywhere? <laughs> And he said, you know, you should lose some weight. Now, and I want to argue with the doctor. What does he know anyway? But, you know, I, I, I looked at myself in the mirror the other day. There was nobody, Elizabeth was somewhere, you know, I was in the bathroom by myself. I, looked at my, I said, if I lose my, some weight, my body will get flabby. You know, and I'm all looking sexy. <laughs> I swear to God. I'm thinking I won't look as sexy because right now, I mean, I got a little belly here. Yeah, it's okay. I got, I got a little pouch here, but it's okay. <laughs> I, so, I don't want that thing to get flabby and all wrinkled up. <laughs> you call me wrinkled belly. <laughs> so I ain't losing no weight. I mean, I lose a little bit. I, you know, I have to have, keep him happy with me, but I, I ain't keep telling me I should lose 20 pounds. Man, I know you don't lost it, man. You no, know, I, I start, then I start looking flabby. My arms all flipping, flapping. When I, I, Right now, you know. <laughs> no, I'm just beginning to live. <laughs> Let me say this to you out loud. We're going to get to the promised land. I'm going to lead you there. We're going to get there. Fear thou not. Be not of faint heart or spirit. We're going to get to the promised land. And I can tell you this. I've been here 40 years. I will never forsake you. I will never leave you. I will never betray you. Never. I can tell you that. You can depend on that. You can take that to the bank. You're looking at a man who will never walk away from you. I will never choose anybody other than you. You are as precious to me as anything I can ever imagine. And those of you who have stood with me, I just can't tell you how much you mean to me. Uh, I will never. We're going to get to the promised land. We're going to get there. I'm going to do one better than Moses. I'm going in with y'all. When we get to Atla, I'm going in with you. And we'll turn one more corner. And that is the point up that we have a powerful youth church. Very powerful. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. Our youth church. I, I have to tell you that I was very encouraged two weeks ago by the action of gymnast Simone Biles, who is... Uh, at in the last, uh, if you will, World Games, Olympic Games, she won several medals and she came to prominence. Simone Biles did. And um, she, uh, in this Tokyo event, she developed what was known as the twisties, or at least that's what they call it. I have no idea what it is. It's when you're flipping and turning and you don't know where you are in those flips and turns. And she dropped out of the competition after doing one competition, she dropped out. Some of you who follow the Olympics may have noticed that about her. And as a young woman, she dropped out. And the whole world descended upon her. Every newspaper from Australia to Japan to America to Peru all descended on her. She's dropping out of the competition. And why uh, is she dropping out? But she said something in the midst of that first statement. She says, my life is more than being a gymnast. You know, and she says, I need to protect who I am. 
And for a young girl, I said, my God, what courage she has to be able to say that. And then a week later, I hear she's back in the competition. She gets back up on the bar and she wins a bronze medal. After all of that pressure, I don't know people who have walked with the Lord could deal with the kind of pressure that that young girl dealt with and was able to still win a medal, but she kept everybody informed. This is not just about me being a gymnast. My life is important to me. And when this is over with, I have something else my life is meaning. I mean, for a young girl to say that, I, I, I feel very proud about her. And then there's this Allison Felix as well, who has won more gold medals than anybody in track and field. She's won more. Carl Lewis held the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the title of winning more medals than anybody in history in track and field to this young Hamite woman named Allison Felix in this past Tokyo event. And the thing I want to say about Allison Felix and about Simone Biles, they're both young Hamite women. They both got boyfriends. Hamite, I, I think Simone Biles' boyfriend is some sort of football player. He's a big guy, you know, and she's all cuddled up to him. I don't, I don't know. Who, look, she looks like she looks, she's happy. She definitely don't go down that other road. You know the road I'm talking about. She's happy with him. And, uh, and that's her boyfriend. And then Alex, uh, Allison Felix, uh, she got a boyfriend too. When she came home the other day, she got a two-year-old daughter. And uh, her daughter greeted her, Mommy, where you been for the month? And they have a little, little house. I'm not sure what state it's in. He was there, had his cap turned on backwards. Come on, come here. he's a homie. That's all right. Turn that baseball cap back. He's a big guy, right? And Allison Felix, she's got a man. And they got a little house. And I thought to myself, how wonderful. The whole world is not going down the LGBT crowd and praise Almighty God. Praise Almighty God. Now, let me lay this on you. We got a, some young people in our church. There are a lot of them, all of them. None of them are, I'm not gonna call everybody's name here today, but I'm gonna call Anna LaFleur. I'll call her name. I think she's got the strength. In fact, by the way, back up a little bit, every time I look at Simone Biles, I think about Precious LaFleur. She looks like her, acts like her, kind of talks like her too. But I, think, I believe that Anna is just as strong, Elder LaFleur. I think your daughter, you may not know her, you've, had to, you've been raising her, and you, but I think she's got the same constitution. I think we can trust her. I think we can. Elizabeth said to me the other day, Anna, watch what all these other young people did to this pulpit. And uh, I think she's made up in her heart that she ain't going down that road. But more importantly, she knows this is the play. And that we can trust her. I, I think if Anna got out in the world like Simone Biles, we have to worry about her. I think she's gonna come home pure and, 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 and blessed and righteous the way Simone Biles. I believe that about her. And uh, I believe that about Esther Butler as well. And I got some assignments for them because I believe they can handle it. Uh, I, I would to God that we could somehow not reach out to Simone Biles. I, I, I should send Victory over there to talk to her. <laughs> Y'all know Victory? Y'all ever see, <laughs> see her on the monkey bars? Um, but I have to tell you that the young man that's just in our church, you know, Jeremiah, I, you know, he was aiming to go to medical school. His parents are probably terribly ticked at me because he asked me, could he study music? And um, we got a note the other day from someone who says that when the organ cranks up in this house, mm -hmm. I don't know if y'all remember Patrick Ewing and John Starks when they played with the Knicks, when the Knicks did win a couple of games. <laughs> I don't even know they got a team anymore. <laughs> But with Patrick Ewing, they want it. And John Starks, he'd go back, he'd shoot that three-pointer. Y'all remember? But the organ would play in the Madison Square. Y'all remember that organ? It's every time they hit organ, and it's just your reminds me of the organ. That, uh, and it's right. And the, this organ, he plays that organ in a very powerful way. His parents are probably ticked off no end at me uh, for saying study music if that's where your heart is at. I, I simply want to say we got a powerful youth church. It isn't just that I'm, I'm, I'm thankful to God and that I will not forsake you, and I will not leave you. Well, we got some people who, here now, young people, they're not gonna do what the other young people did. They're not gonna do it. They're not gonna let the devil get them. And they're not gonna go down that LGBTQ road. They're not going down that. 
They, 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 Simone Biles ain't on it. She's the world champion. Allison Felix ain't on it. And she got a boyfriend and she's happy. She got a baby too. So I, I want to point out that we're going to be reaching out to these young people. I trust them. I do. Now, I know how you parents can get all jittery. I understand that. But these young people, they love this house. And they, they want to see it prosper. So y'all hang in with, with me. Um, I, I'm going to be through with you in just a moment. I want to I, turn one more corner. And that is to say, with our young people and with those that are going on for other educational attainments uh, and degrees, who are not looking just to get a degree so they can go apply at some institution and get a better job and get more money. That's the last thing that's on Precious LaFleur's mind. She just wants to be a better person. She just wants to grow. She wants to live in her full potential. And I see that in so many people that are part of the, uh, yes. I'm told that they have the clip that I was uh, ma making reference of a few moments ago. <clears throat> uh, and I, well, not a few moments ago, when I first drove up, they had that clip. So I'm going to, can I just pause for just a second and we rewind ourselves because my statement is this is that there's somebody in the world who realizes that I got a word in my mouth. Suppose Wolf Blitzer realized that, or Anderson Cooper, or Washington Post. Suppose they realized that, that there's a word from Almighty God. So Mr. Engineer, if you have it, thank y'all so very much. In front of you, there is a crystal ball. What do you see? Very dark, but once the dark itself has done as done in the days of the Bible, in the beginning of creation, has darkness itself cannot maintain. It, 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 it is not a consistent, it's not eternal. It just isn't. It just isn't. And in that ball, I see the darkness. But once that darkness fades and it no longer has its power, light will flood and flourish humanity. And Jeremy, I'm glad you asked the question because I think a large part of humanity, of uh, the unity of humanity on planet Earth has to do with the dark black man finally realizing where he needs to kneel and pray, what he needs to do in order to be able to integrate himself into society. And as a result of that, uh, it'll bring global global peace in many ways. Listen, here in America, politics in America is always about black and white. Republican Party, Democrat Party. Democrats got the black people on their side, and Republicans don't. And all the issues are around race. But once that darkness, that blackness, that is removed as an as an existential, if you will, part of our existence, light will come. But it isn't going to be easy, and I'm not sure how long. The hair on my arms, Pastor Manning, is standing up. <laughs> Just from listening to that. It's a great way to end our conversation. I know that you have to, I know that you have to leave. Um, may I say that you are a true gentleman, uh, and it's an absolute pleasure uh, chatting to you. All right. Um, that is a great segue to where I want to come to now. And that is, is that we need to evangelize people like Jeremy. We need him on our side. And there are others. He's not the only one. There are others that hear us and know of us. But the darkness is keeping the light from prevailing at present. But we need to evangelize and dismantle what I would refer to as a satanic racism by the pension of those Negroes. That what they have effectively done, and I don't want to seem boastful, but on the other hand, I, I, I'm not somehow or another trying to be humble about this. But I consider myself an excellent student of history um, in studying both global 
uh, uh, global and world history, and American history as well. And let me tell you what I've discovered. And, and that is that um, at the advent or the end of the Civil War in 1865, and uh, the Reconstruction period was launched, and the abolitionists were able to have their due and their day, and many of the Southerners went home realizing that they need to change their methods from slavery to sharecropping and, and sharing with, with the people that had, in many ways, the slaves had been friends of many of the slave owners. It wasn't the way you see it many times on television. Many times people who were slaves went to church with the white slave owner. Many times the slaves, and I'm one of them, descendant thereof, were thankful that we came to America because it was here we found Jesus. It was here that the white slave owner taught us about the blood of Jesus. And we'd go to church on Sunday where our slave owner told us that Jesus saves. And we sing songs and wrote a whole lot of very powerful hymns called Negro hymns. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Jesus keep me near the cross. And, and on and on and on, by coming to, on the, on, no matter the auspices of which brought us here with slavery, we found Jesus here, where perhaps were we in Africa, would not have found him, would not have known him, would not have worshipped him. And at the advent of the slavery time and doing slavery, began to build churches across the South, across Mississippi, Texas, Louisiana. We began to build churches and we could go to them, but the slaves could go to them on Sunday and worship all day long. And the boss man said nothing. And at the conclusion of the Civil War, we took our church monies, our potatoes and collard greens and peanuts and soybeans, put them together began to sell them and we began to build institutions like Morehouse and Hampton and Fisk University and Howard University. All those schools were built from 1865 to 1890. You're talking less than 25 years as slavery ended. We got Morehouse College, Spelman, Fisk, Howard University. They're all built and established and bought and paid for with slave money. But then after that came people like Booker T, not Booker T Washington, but Frederick Douglass, who was a hustler from way back when, born in Baltimore, said he learned how to read by picking up pages of the Bible off the streets. That's a lie. That's a lie. <laughs> Nobody tears up a Bible and throws it on the street. That's a lie that he told. He pimped both black women and white women. He got white women to pay for his his passage all the way to London, where he lived in London like a king. He went to, went to London first class and then came back, married a poor, well not a poor, but a Hamite woman, took all her money and started his newspaper. Broke, she went broke giving money to Frederick Douglass. He's a farce if there ever has been one pimp. And him after, then after him, you know, people like W.E.B. Du Bois and this other opera singer, I forget his name now, but, um, they, they all began what was a new civil war, realized that the South had been defeated. They began to raise up themselves against and began to show venom rather than walking in Jesus, they began to show venom. Thusly, it was necessary by 1920 with people like W.E.B. Du Bois for those white, young, if you will, Southerners to build an institution to protect themselves. Now you are never gonna believe this, and it's okay if you don't believe it, it's all right, I'm good. But the Ku Klux Klan was established because of the violence that was now being perpetrated by people like W.E.B. Du Bois who had gone to Harvard, got a PhD degree, and now stirring up people to become Marxists and communists against the white establishment. And so that unit, that was established outside of the Civil War, a military, if you will, of the Confederacy, in order to be a protector. Now you're never gonna agree with that, but look at it from this context. Were it not for this continuation by, if you will, so-called communist Marxist black people like Frederick Douglass and W.E.B. Du Bois, we would not have had all of this if we had just continued on the same track of building more housing, building what Booker T. Washington built, building how we just continued 
on the same track, there would not be this fighting we have going. And right now, it's continuing to escalate with Dr. King and Black Lives Matter and the Nation of Islam and the Black, what a Black Panther. It goes on and on and on with black folk are continuing to fight white folk based on slavery some years ago, which in many ways was a benefit for them. We got to evang- we got to wake the people up to see what's happening to them. And what's worse, what's worse is that you got these pinch those Negroes, right, who go to school, unlike Precious, get a degree like W.E.B. Du Bois, and then they snooze up to many of the Japheth people, get positions as politicians, as mayors, and so forth. And they used to call them in the old days, the house Negroes. They live good, but the life of the man in the street don't ever change. It gets worse. I came to my window this morning, and I looked out on 123rd Street and Lenox Avenue, and there's another man out there nodding. I'll tell you, my brothers and sisters, every time I look out my window, there's somebody nodding out. We're in the 21st century, and you got black men still nodding out on heroin after having a black president. You got all this poverty up and down the street. We need to evangelize and tell people what these pinch nose, hate-filled Negroes are doing to you. They are destroying you. And somebody need to be get up and tell you. Somebody need to be say it. We need to evangelize. You know, Obama, Obama is living in Martha's Vineyard. Have y'all seen that joint he got up there? I don't understand this. I mean, I don't understand y'all. What is it with Obama and Al Sharpton? Al Sharpton is a reformed drug dealer that cut a deal with the FBI to snitch on the Italians in Staten Island who were bringing heroin to Harlem. And Al was a dealer. Read it. It's in the New York Post. The man was a drug dealer turned snitch. The New York Post called him Reverend Rapp. The other news called called him see, I said, where is it at? How is it that a man who was a former drug dealer, unrepentant by the way, gets a job on MSNBC and becomes the number one friend of the so-called black president, Al, or Al Sharpton and Obama? What is it with y'all? <laughs> the thing with it is, you people worship drug dealers. That's right. You worship him. At any rate, we, we need to be able to, to, um, uh, to bring this evangelism to uh, the people that are so ignorantly lost. And the reason why I believe we can do this, and I believe the time for us has come. And I'm going to do everything I possibly can to, to affect this. I, I believe that we are in line that we are in the perfect, we are in the perfect will of God. That we're not one second behind. As I stand here today, there's nothing that's left warning in terms of who we are, what we've accomplished, what we've done. There's nothing, there's nothing left wanting. Now, there are people who are not going to accept who we are. And that, that's, that's good. That well, was cool, or good, or whatever. But God has accepted us as who we are. And let's continue who we, what, what God's called us to do. We're, we're in the midst now of a very terrible time. And I think that the judgment of people like Precious, or the people like Anna, the judgment of people in this house like Elder the Floor, that, that judgment, that, that, that judgment that people see, they see and they see this house. <laughs> and they search all over Harlem and don't find anything like this house. And they search all over Harlem, all the churches go across the street. You look! The children, the obedience. <laughs> I guarantee you, their parents who ain't never seen children act as obedient as they see our children. You just don't see that in today's world. Children talk back to their parents. 
say they ain't gonna do it, won't do it. You've never seen anything like what happens here. Every day, we're in the right place. We're in the right place. I, I, I want to say this, that America's going crazy, you know. They, they say Trump was going to be president yesterday. Y'all know about that? They, they said Biden was going to resign and Trump was going to be reinstated. These people are crazy. <laughs> but they got some more stuff coming. I do want to warn, and I've, I've, I've exhausted my time here today. I do want to warn that um, the uh, event that's going on in um, in Afghanistan, if you don't mind my waxing political for just a moment, is a, is a travesty and a tragedy and a grave injustice that uh, the Taliban, and they're not the tragedy or the travesty, but the Taliban has advanced now where they surrounded the major city of Afghanistan called Kabul. They've taken Kandahar and Herat and a number of other cities and it's just, the nation has fallen to some 75,000 fighters called the Taliban. Uh, the Taliban is America's dirty secret. She's got several of them. But you remember the Taliban I taught 15 years ago were a group initially called the Mujahideen. Remember, I taught that. And they recruited a young man from out in Occidental College named Barack Hussein Obama who when he became president or became candidate as president, he, did, he stood before and got his, 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 his aiders, eight people to aid him, to stand, tell the media, don't call my name Hussein, just call me Barack, but don't call me Hussein. And you don't hear anybody ever call, his name is Barack Hussein. He was recruited and he sent to Afghanistan and he trained what was then the Mujahideen to become a political force called the Taliban. The Taliban got their origin from Barack Hussein Obama, who taught them in weapons, who was an interpreter for them, because he lived in Indonesia. He was a, a, understood the Hashemite language, and he spoke it to them and trained them. Spent two years there. As a result of that, they gave him a degree from Columbia University, where he never set foot on campus. And we, we, we demonstrated it clearly. So the Taliban now, and the reason why we've been in Afghanistan for 20 years, and had to leave the way we're leaving is because that secret is known. And soon it's going to come to pass. Now what's gonna happen when it becomes apparent that the Taliban was formed by the so-called first black president, Barack Hussein Obama. Out, we wanna reach out to the Hashemites, that's the tribe of people that allegedly are aligned with the Prophet Muhammad in terms of their Islamic faith and their Islamic belief. I want to reach out to them. I'm going to establish a program that we might be able to do that. But I want to warn that we're leaving Afghanistan in shame and in defeat. And a lot of people's lives are going to be destroyed as a result of that. That helped America while they were there. If you're not paying attention to this, it's all right. I'm paying attention for you. I need to also inform you that the Soviet Union went into Afghanistan in 1988. I'm sorry, 1979. They went in there to try to take over Afghanistan, spent 10 years, and the goat herders beat them as well. And Obama was instrumental in helping the Afghanistan, the Mujahideen, to defeat the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union pulled out of, of, the, um, of Afghanistan uh, in 1988. Now, right now, you can see all these nations on that are the, on the west of the Soviet Union, such as Kazakhstan, uh, Uzbekistan, Georgia, the Ukraine that you've heard so much about, uh, Moldova, Belarus, Latvia, Estonia. These are all, they were part of the Soviet Union and then this large mass of land is the Soviet Union. All of these nations from Latvia to Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan and Ukraine all fell away and after Russia got defeated in Afghanistan, they lost their international and global footing. I want to say to you that a similar kind of thing can potentially happen here in America because we've been defeated by the Afghans as well. And America is at now is more divided than she has ever been in the history of this nation. I thought it would be important for us to understand that. Then America went into Afghanistan on the idea that it was responsible for 
I watched them and the demolition that they did on the Surfside building down in Florida going back a couple of weeks ago. That building that fell in the middle of the night and then they brought in some demolition crews to bring the building down all in one fell swoop. I watched that demolition there of that Surfside building and the way it came down so smoothly, so evenly, all in one place in a puff of dust. Well, that's the same way both of the World Trade Tower building came down. You just don't do that if you get hit by an airplane. You just don't do that. Now, I know what they say, that, that I'm against America and, and, and that it was done by the Muslims in Afghanistan. But yeah, you can see it. Those buildings came down very smoothly as if it had been planted demolition. Go back and look at, compare the two. I'll compare it for you to say that to you. Y'all, y'all stand up. I... Uh, I, I'm thankful to the Lord. I'm thankful to him. I'm encouraged today. I've had a lot of wonderful things, times in my life. I, I talked to Jeremiah, I talked to some of my young boys, right? And uh, I'm going to sit down and talk to him and tell him, listen, man, you know, I went over to Paris, France all by myself. <laughs> Packed my bags. I had just been the first year pastor of this church and the first year student at Union. Of course, I had the destination. And, uh, you know, I wasn't married or anything. So I got on a flight and off to Paris I went. And from Paris uh, into uh, Germany, from Germany into Switzerland. Uh, and all by myself, nobody <laughs> but me, and having a good time. And uh, just meeting people and having uh, food in restaurants, all by myself. And you young men, y'all need to get that courage. Amen. Live a little. <laughs> anyway, uh, I want to, I, I want to, when we get back, talk about the sexual impulses that is leading America and the churches today. Everything's based on sexual impulse. Elizabeth and I sitting, we're watching television, and now they got two men and two children, a girl and a boy. Yeah. It's everywhere you look, Elder Smith. It's every, and they're pushing it and pushing it. And God will hold us responsible if we don't hold up a standard and don't let these children be influenced by this madness that's being pushed on the televisions. And then parents are pushing it too. Well, that's my child. And I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's my flesh and blood. And I'm going to turn my back on my child. I don't care what Pastor Man said, but I'm, 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 not, I'm not turning my back on my child. I'll turn my back on Pastor Manning and, I, I, and, and Moses and the Bible be damned. But that's my child and I love my child. And she says she's in love with another woman. I've never heard such filth in all my life. Filth. That ain't your child. And you ain't no parent. The job of a parent is to teach the truth, not let the child perpetrate a lie. I've never heard of such filth in the churches, in the homes. We got to stand. We, we, we got to stand. You, you lose people, and people will no longer decide to be your friend. This brother, this brother over here, he's preaching the other day. This one over here. He's preaching the other day on his job. And he, he worked for, where you work for? John J. College or somebody? On his job, the supervisor told him now there's a, a, a woman, wait a minute, there's a man who used to be a man, but now he's a woman. So he said, oh, Hard Rock over here. <laughs> he told him, he said, now you got to call him a woman now. You remember when he was a man, but you had not called him a so Hard Rock over here. <laughs> yeah. so, are you kidding me? And then they told him, if you don't do it, we're going to fire you. They got to stop. When you hear somebody say, that's my child. Or that's my friend. That there is nothing more blasphemous. There's no spirit as black as the spirit that is talking to you that says to you to promote that. Don't you ever forget it. Don't you think that somehow another God is winking at that? Don't you think God is winking at that? And somehow another God's going to forgive that. No, he ain't. Ask the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, did he forgive it? 
And so I, I, I want to say to you today that I'm thankful to be here. Uh, I've never felt better. I got the world's best looking wife. Praise Almighty God. Boy, I'll tell you, Elizabeth is a mad, a bad mama jamma. <laughs> I mean, come on now, come on, we can talk, can we talk? We can talk, right? We, we can be up front with one another, y'all don't mind. Yeah, Lord. <laughs> I got it going on. Hold <laughs> on, that person. That's right, say amen. <laughs> oh, William, that old William boy over there, up there here, out there on the wall, this other boy was getting married. What's his name? That, that Michael boy was getting married. I saw Williams and his, his wife out there squeezing on one another. Oh, then I said, sitting out in the public street. <laughs> An old man like him squeezing a woman. In the <laughs> I rebuked him. <laughs> he said, but it's my wife. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Y'all give the Lord a round of applause and say, thank God the darkness don't last always. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise Almighty God. You, you, you may take your seats. Um, I want to, um, first of all, I encourage you to give your tithing and your offering and all of that. I want you to know you're blessed. Next time you get an opportunity to pray, just let the Lord talk to you. Because we're in the right places. We let him grow you. Amen. <clears throat> but the tithe in the offering is a good thing. It uh, breaks poverty on your life. You ain't invested in Wall Street. If you were, it didn't mean anything but the tithe and the offering is how we operate over here. That's what we do. And that's how we live. We don't do no raffles or car sales or this or that or the other. And how we meet our financial obligations. Praise the Lord. Now, thank you for giving and a cash app is where you can do that. I want to ask you to come up close for just one second, and I, I want to talk to three year and older veterans of the uh, Trust in Lord Hour, uh, the Open Rewards Prayer Meeting, the Manning Report, and the Pulpit of Power, those four ministries that we do every week, uh, producing at least 20 different ministries or sermons every week. If you are a three year or older veteran, by old I mean four years, five years, six years, seven years, 10 years, 12 years uh, old veteran, of, of any of these ministries that we do on a daily basis every week, and you are not a supporter, you've not joined with the, uh, the ministry to give your, uh, to pledge your support and your alignment with what we've been teaching. I, and I, my question is why? Uh, you've had three years to observe us. You've had three years to listen to us on a daily basis, all weekend, all day long, any hour of the day. We're uh, broadcasting uh, you've had three years to watch our various successes. You've three years to watch our ups and downs. You've had three years to listen to the tenor or the consistency of what we have said, whether we are consistent or whether we are all over the chart and what we do and what we believe. You've had three years to watch people around us who have made the commitment to join with our ministry and church and to financially support it. And by the way, I want to give another shout out to Brother Jesse Munez out there in San Bernardino, along with uh, uh, Goldfinger, who is just extraordinary giver, and others that do extraordinary uh, giving to our ministry. My question is to you, if you are a three-year veteran or older, why haven't you joined? Why haven't you committed? And I suppose some of the reasons would say, well, Pastor, man, I belong to another church. And uh, why? How could you, how could you, after three years of hearing me teach about the Sabbath, about righteousness, about the tribulation, and listen to me faithfully as you do, and still go sit up in another pastor's face? How could you be? It's like, you, it's like a woman sleeping with two men. 
You know, one she likes during the week and the other she likes on the weekend. It, it is hypo- it's hi- hypocritical. Um, y- y- how could you do that? I mean, it's, it's, you start three months ago, I can understand. Well, it may take you some time to evaluate. It may take you some time to look at me, to discover you know, who I am. You say, well, pastor, that's not that I don't belong to another church or ministry. I, I, you, I'm with you. But there's some things you say I like and there's some things you say I don't like. Why? Why is it that some, you, you've made a decision that there's some things that, I, that you don't like are stronger than the things that you do like? I, you know, I am not a psychiatrist, but I am an analyst. And I have to tell you, I analyze the world and our understanding. But the understanding and wisdom tells me this, that if there are things that a person such as myself that I am saying, there, there is no room to disagree with what I am saying, unless your purpose is to find something to disagree with. Let's say, for instance, you say, well, I like the fact that you talk about Obama, but I don't like the fact that you talk about Trump. Let's say, for instance, you're one of those, right? Well, the purpose, it isn't that you, it isn't that you just like what I say about Obama, but don't like what I say about Trump. What it is, is that you are looking for a reason to support Trump. It isn't that you don't like it. It's just that you don't like the fact that I'm saying something about it. It isn't that what I'm saying is wrong. Let me put it that way. It isn't what I'm saying is wrong or indifferent. You know it's right. But you have, you've lived your life or you've come up or you've been raised with a doctrine that you can really live in a false reality. That's where you are. You've been raised in a doctrine that you can live in a false reality. That is to say you can like the truth about Obama but you don't like the truth about Trump. And it's the same truth. It's the same truth. There's no difference. But because you have been indoctrinated to live in a false reality, you are really a person who needs psychological debriefing. But trust me, there are zillions of people around the world who live that way. There are people who know what I'm saying about Trump. Obama is right. They know it. But they choose to ignore it based on the fact that they find a reality that isn't true and they've settled in there. Say, that's one of the reasons why I've not made a commitment because, you know, I I, I don't like, I wish you would support what I support. But the, the truth of the matter is, then why do you come? You've given three years or more of your life to listen to me? Three years of your life to listen to me, and you know you and you're not tired of listening to me yet. And you've given three years of your life, and over the past three years, your life has been greatly upgraded. You've learned, you've been educated, you've been enlightened. And let me say this to you. If you make the commitment, say, well, Pastor, I'm joining with you, and I'm going to support. I'm going to do the tithe and offering. I'm going to do the first fruit. I'm going to keep the Sabbath. Your life is going to soar. Now, listen to me very carefully. Now, I'm not going to leave you alone after this. Listen to me very carefully. You come as often as you come over the past three years because you're being helped. You're being educated. You're being enlightened. Right? Right. But the thing that you... Like whether you you say, well, I like what you say about Obama, but I don't like what you say about Trump. You do the same thing with the word of God, such as you like the things I say, the teachings of that thing, the way I explain the Bible, the way I break it all down and make it clear. But when it comes to things like money or tithing and offering or the Sabbath, well, that you know is also true, but because of your false reality, because you really need a psychological debriefing, because of your false reality, you choose not to believe the tithe or the first fruit or the Sabbath. Now, it isn't that it isn't true. It's as true as all the other things I've said. But you live in a false reality where you, avoid, you try to ignore the truth about the tithe. And so you don't do it. But, that is the, but the, everything else I say is good to go. Everything I ever say is good to go. Good enough to share with your friends. It makes you laugh. It educates you. It enlightens you. But the tithe? Well, 
And the full commitment to the ministry, well, the first fruit offerings, well, the Sabbath. But that's all true as well. But you have chosen and you've been raised and indoctrinated to have a dual reality, which is dangerous. Jesus said this, and I'll leave you. He said, I would rather you be the hot or cold, but not lukewarm. You're lukewarm. You have a dual reality. He said, if you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I would rather you be completely stomped down against Pastor Manny, trying to, dis- trying to take him down. Be fully against him. Be against him with all of your strength. Or be fully for him with all of your strength. But don't be in the middle somewhere lukewarm. You know better than to be spit out of the mouth of Jesus if you're lukewarm. So what's it going to be? You're going to make the commitment and grow and be even greatly better blessed or you're going to continue to walk in the lukewarm spit of the mouth of the Savior. I'm James David Manning, everybody. I'm the Lord's servant.